alluded to, I'll talk about the fundamental imbalances in the Canadian housing market and more really more specifically on what we see and what we see from our perspective as uh, you know, only 22,000 rental units across Canada. Uh, but I'll start with a quick background on uh, Centurion itself. And the gentleman who started Centurion was uh, Greg Roman. And his career before Centurion, I think, is very telling. He was a derivatives trader, um, worked in Toronto, London, Hong Kong, and Singapore, rose up the ranks to a very high level. And I highlight that as a derivatives trader, one, because you understand his mindset. As a derivatives trader, you're there looking to minimize risk for your clients, how you can structure products, investments, financing, whatever it is, to minimize uh, risk for your clients. And he's brought that same mindset to Centurion. Very much, first and foremost, protect investors' capital, provide income, and then provide some growth on top of that. And always doing things with a long-term mindset, always with a long-term outlook. And as you can see here, uh, the fund was launched in, back in 2009. Greg had actually launched, been dealing in, or Greg Roman, our president, the founder, had been in real estate since the late 90s. Uh, he had portfolios and buildings around the world. And then uh, once he retired from a derivatives trader, moved his family back to Toronto in uh, 2000, did his own, you know, his own personal investing, then launched a Friends and Family LP in 2006, and then launched the REIT we have today that was uh, in August of 2009 and since grown uh, to 7.2 billion in AUM. And as Austin said, did this over 22,000 units and 157 buildings uh, and continue to grow. We see you can see great opportunities in the Canadian marketplace, and you'll uh, you'll see why over the next few slides here. Really, what's you know the issue here in Canada, uh, the fundamentals behind making multi-residential I think a very strong investment opportunity is one is unaffordability. I'm in downtown Toronto, and what you pay condo-wise or house-wise, and what you get, uh, it's interesting. I'll say that <laughs> you don't get very much for a million dollars these days. Um, and obviously what's driving a lot of demand in Canada's population growth and what that, and a lot of that is coming from people coming from abroad. Um, again, a good thing, big country, but we didn't really manage the supply side in Canada very well. Um, and here, and on top of that, I mean, obviously our focus is on rental apartment buildings. We're slow to build in Canada. I don't think that'd be a surprise to too many people. Um, and what's slowing things down even further and making less projects feasible are the high costs of construction. And I'll go over that, but just, High cost of debt, high cost of inputs, you know, it's, and I would say uh, bureaucracy can slow things down as well. Um, so we're, we're not making the situation really very any easier. And when I talk about unaffordability, I'll explain this chart here. Uh, you can see, I'll just use Toronto as an example on the far left there. Annual qualifying, annual household qualifying income means you want to buy the median house, but only spend 32% of your income to do so you have to earn pretty much $250,000 in Canada. You really, sorry, in Toronto, to actually make it feasible, make it viable. You have to actually have a very high level of income to do that. Not everyone makes $250,000 in Toronto. I'll say, you obviously see serious, even in Vancouver, very serious uh, issues with uh, affordability and, and uh, incomes that's available for most, most people, most residents of the city. And so you can see there that dark blue line, you know, if you can make $250,000, you can spend, you know, free income. Pre-tax, 32% of your uh, of your income on that housing. But you can also see the median household annual income highlighted in yellow. Far, far well against Toronto, well below $250,000, just under $100,000. Similar situation in uh, obviously in Vancouver, even a little bit lower. And you can see where it is around the country, Montreal. The, the spread there is a little bit different, a little bit more affordable. Um, Calgary, again, similar situation, but still. Uh, not quite where you want to see it. And Victoria, obviously, on the island, a uh, big difference between, uh, you know, qualifying income and actual income for most people and then uh, the mortgage payment uh, percentage of income. So you see where in Canada, where we're focused is where one, a lot of people are moving to. We're in the large population centers around Canada and uh, they're not they're not very affordable for very many people at all. So a lot of people do have to go into uh, the rental market. Really, I think this highlights it very well just to do the high cost of housing. And it's not going to get any easier. It's hard to see how that solution really is uh, anything that comes out that will really solve that problem. And I mentioned immigration is, again, we're a big country. I don't think we've managed necessarily very well, but you can see the very strong population growth here. And that point, the first bullet point on the right is first nine months, first three quarters of 2023, we had over a million people come to Canada. So by the way, it's the highest ever for a full year, full year since uh, confederation in 1867 
that's from stats can i found that number uh it's very telling we're obviously a very strong population group you can see where uh, that bar chart is going and right now the target is to continue having just a, pretty much a half a million people immigrating to uh, canada but that doesn't really factor in what that does not factor in temporary workers and that does not factor in uh, international students and as i think the previous uh presenter mentioned like it's a tough being in the student if you're looking for student housing and we do have some student housing assets um all these people coming into canada do put demand on uh, the housing sector or put the put demand on a, a housing sector with a real lack of supply um so really we're seeing a million plus people coming into canada that's quite a bit on top of what we just see there as a, i guess they're you know immigration immigrants coming to canada looking to get permanent residency so it is something that's going to continue and i don't know if you've seen anyone really looking to uh reduce the, the demand coming into Canada. We've seen a little bit on the student housing side, but I think we're still going to free, see 360,000 uh, coming to Canada this year and next. So it's still a big number. This gives you a little bit more of an idea, but there I just mentioned the first point there. Most people for the first nine months of 2023 since Confederation. And again, there's going to be 1.5 million people over the next three years, plus, plus uh, temporary workers, plus international students. So it's going to be well over a million for the next three years. I think we're uh, comfortable saying that. We want to look a, into it. Um, you can see, and we can talk about the number of international students coming to Canada, like giving us some great, great universities, great four-year universities. And uh, we had 435,000 coming in in the first half of 2023. So there, there was a need to reduce that demand. And I don't think there's a circumstance for international students. They weren't necessarily getting the best education, depending on uh, those, those institutions that they were choosing to go to. Um, you can see some of them did see it obviously come to Canada get the university as a pathway to uh, permanent residency, which is a great thing. Uh, good to have an educated population. Uh, but you can just see the demand there. And uh, on the far right, just see immigration, immigrants coming to Canada. Um, they're taking up, they're, you know, they're renting, but 30 percent of the rental properties in Canada were occupied by immigrants in 2023. So we've seen that demand. Obviously, a lot of immigrants come to Canada. It can take them a while to get financially established before they can move on and actually jump into home ownership themselves. Um, so we're seeing, again, increasing demand year after year for housing, and especially on the uh, multi-residential side as well. And this, we talk about population growth. This is to the end of 2022, but I like including this slide in there because you can kind of see where things have gone over the years, you know, from 1955 to 2022, where we're seeing some pretty strong population growth. Uh, but you can see a real uptick in population growth starting in uh, 2016 where we really got well above 400,000, pushed close to 500,000, obviously COVID dropped things off, and then you can see that sharp spike again uh, once COVID uh, you know, put into the background a little bit. So the demand is real. And what's really telling is obviously that dramatic orange chart, uh, but right below that is uh, construction completion. You can see there's really not much of a change over the years, maybe a bit of a change from the you know, early 70s, but really, it's very cyclical. Nothing, you're not seeing a big jump up with the increase in population. So that's why we're seeing such an exceptionally tight market here in Canada. The supply is just not keeping up with the demand that's out there. And it's hard, really, I don't say it's hard to see how that's going to really change anytime soon. And here we talk about the demand. This is actually a bit dated. The number right now, as of the end of Q3 2023, would be 1.5%. The vacancy rate in Canada for multi residential is at 1.5%. So even lower than what it was in uh, you know, 2000 and 2001. So the demand is again increasing and the supply is noticeable. I don't, I get this question where I don't use, you know, where do people live? Obviously it's a very tight market, very tough market uh, to get into the housing that you're looking for. I think people are put into, I'll say less than desirable circumstances. I think especially on the student side of being, you know, Far too many people are living in far too small of a space in uh, certain areas. So it's not very desirable. I don't think it reflects very well on us, but we do need to <laughs> look at these numbers and realize one, the demand is there and supply is uh, lagging by quite a bit. Sorry, we'll click on the mouse there. And what does that mean? I want to put on the number side here. What does that mean for uh, the rents? This is really going across Canada, but you can see, you know, year on year, starting with the studio, one bed, two bed, three bed. On the far, those are double digit, double digit, double digit increases in rents year on year. That's quite meaningful. That, that makes a big impact for uh, for people. That uh, can be quite expensive. And what we see, I'll just relate to our portfolio, is people leave in in Ontario, in BC. We have very similar, say, uh, rental rules on on 
internally. You're limited with how much you can increase rent if someone stays in the unit. Uh, but once that person leaves, you can increase rents to the market rate. So we're seeing if someone's usually stayed in there for one year, you're, you know, mid to high single digits, depending on the unit. Um, you know, looking at two years, you're seeing, you know, double digits for sure, and then three years, 20 plus percent. So it, it is, uh, these increases are meaningful. And it is you know, not, not easy to solve this, this problem, but that demand is there. And that demand is pushing the prices up and up across the board on the rental side. I did talk about lack of supply here in Canada. And uh, I think this is I think very telling. One is just, you can see on the right-hand side there, that box that shows building home now costs 51% more than they did in 2020. So a lot of the, all the inputs that go into a home, building a high rise, building low rise, building stick and brick, whatever it is, all those inputs have gone up. And never mind the high cost of uh, financing. So what we see, and we, we do have a little sleeve of lending in our portfolio, about 6% of the REIT we do lend to developers. Now the average interest rate that we charge is 12.9%. So it's not cheap finance. The biggest, the biggest, you know, base developers out there will go get cheaper financing from the big banks, but those who are working with us, uh, with developers, but just the cost of capital goes up. And uh, again, first of doing a on average of 12.9%. So when that comes down, that'll make things easier for developers, but we're still seeing the high cost of debt. These are having a meaningful impact on a lot of uh, these projects. And, and the, as you can see, the inputs there are going up. So that can really change whether a project will actually be able to get finished. And we've seen, we've seen this in, uh, I'll use the GTA as an example. Uh, it was in 2022, about 10,000 units worth of condo units were canceled. 2023, or last year, uh, about 14,000 units worth of condo were canceled. So it's, you get a project in place, you get your pre-sales in place, and then the costs have just run away. So the developers are just going to simply cancel those projects. So it simply means, you know, supply is coming down and we need more supply. And again, just we see a lot of deals relating back to the lending that we do. see a lot of deals and they just don't work. Again, all the high cost of the inputs um, just means simply we don't see this project actually going through. Well, the industrialists, the optimism of the developers sometimes is very blunt. You can't finance this because you see a lot of issues with the high cost of everything. I do stress that. That's an issue. The high cost of everything is uh, from the inputs to the finance is making a big, is a, is a big issue here in Canada. And here we can see the projected provincial shortfall on housing that we require here in Canada. I'll just give you a, a big number for uh, before I jump into this. In, this was a CMHC federal government. Um, they, they looked at Canada back in it was 2021. From that point to 2030, we were on track to build two and a quarter million homes. And by that, everything from single family, detached, condos, rentals, we we're on, on track to build 2.25 million dwellings across the country from 2021 to 2030. They determined that we need another three and a half million on top of that to make uh, housing more affordable. Now, usually I would say this in front of a group of people and you know, who, who wants to raise their hand and think we'll actually build another three and a half million on top of the existing 2.25 million we're going to be building. No one raises their hand. And it, it is not easy to do so. And you'll see in Canada, we're really lacking on a number of things on the supply side. One is skilled labor. You do need a certain skill set, obviously, you have to build a home, a lot of different electricians, plumbers, whatever it is, go into that. Um, so that, that's going to be a big issue. We're not, we don't have enough money in, in the country to fill all the supply that we need. So even if we did remove all the, I would say, all the red tape, um, financing was available immediately, start building immediately. Uh, we just wouldn't have the people available to actually do that. So we are going to, for the foreseeable future, I would say, be continuously behind. And I look at this slide where, and I, I look at this portfolio as, you know, if you look at Ontario, Quebec, and BC, that's where we have 80% of our portfolio. So we're about 76% of the population of Canada is. Um, and we're obviously very purposeful, focused on Canada and where people want to live, but there's also a big shortfall in housing in those areas. So we'd like being in, in, in those areas as an investment perspective. One, we're helping to buy housing that's already needed, uh, but at the same time, it just works. We're in areas where demand is excessive, it's very strong. So it's a great place to be investing from that perspective. We do have investments across the rest of the country, but you can see that the situation isn't quite as, as dramatic in places like Alberta, uh, places like Manitoba and Saskatchewan. Uh, so we're where one purposely where the large population is, where the large population growth is happening. 
um, but we're going to be undersupplied. We want to be part of the solution to supply that housing, but I think from this perspective, we also want to be, uh, be able to provide a message of attractive returns for the years ahead. But there's sort of just 1.5 million shortfall in housing supply for 2030 in Ontario. I can say we're not going to uh, we're not going to get ahead of that problem. We can't really say guarantee too much, but I would say we're not going to get ahead. We're not going to build that extra 1.5 million in Ontario. And here's where our our carbon portfolio is uh, built out here in Canada. And I'll break it down this way: in in or in Ontario and BC, we're in primary and secondary cities. So you can see that blow up around the GTA. Um, so obviously we're not in Toronto. We're so we're not downtown Toronto in the suburbs, Scarborough. You know, Scarborough, Total Roma, Mississauga. We want to be where it's more affordable for more tenants. And I would go, you know, so lower or southwestern Ontario, then I could fit into uh, into the auto, auto area as well. Similar situation in BC, where we're not downtown Vancouver, the price points there is not where you want. We want to focus really on middle income type of housing. Um, so we're out in Surrey, we're on the island, Langford, Victoria, uh, student housing property up in uh, actually Burnaby, and we have a few properties in Kelowna. Although in the rest of the country, we're only in the primary cities. I'm seeing Alberta, that would mean obviously Edmonton, Calgary, uh, Regina, Saskatchewan, Winnipeg, and Manitoba. And uh, even in Quebec, the largest winter market in Canada, our focus is purely on Quebec City, but mostly in the Montreal area. You can see that blow up of uh, where our properties are in Montreal. We do have a few closer to downtown. Price points are different, uh, but we do we really are focused in the, I would say the suburbs of Montreal. And again, I stress that our focus is on, on, on multi-residential is being more, more of a move, especially in, in Ontario, especially in BC, a little bit in, in Quebec, being, being removed from the core of the city. We're not going to be downtown. I, mean, I live in downtown Toronto right now. Like prices here again, uh, what you pay, what you get, you get something very small. <laughs> Let's say for $2,500 a month in rent, maybe 400 square feet. You're not getting very much space. Um, and never, never mind money. So the prices there are, are, I would say, maybe a little bit excessive. But we want to be, as, as landlords, we want to be where there's more potential tenants uh, and relatively more affordable for a lot more people. One, it allows people to get into the, you know, get into the housing or rent from us, but also gives us more run now, let's say, over the years to uh, be able to increase rents over time. Uh, so our apartment buildings are in the dark blue. We do have student housing. We have 16 properties on the student housing side. Great business to be in, 100% occupied. Great business. It's uh, very strong demand. Our focus on the student housing side, though, is four-year universities with at least 10,000 students. That's really our focus. We want to be where there's obviously very strong, very consistent demand. And we've been in the student housing business for quite a while. So our properties in southwest Ontario, in London, are very close to Western University, part of the student community. Uh, same thing where in Waterloo, we're very, very close to Oregon. We're really five minute walk to uh, to campus in those areas. And do a, a, I'll say a few more unique situations where a property in Burnaby is actually on SFB campus. So it's like a lease back situation there, similar situation with a property we have in downtown Toronto at uh, Lyre, formerly Ryerson now Metropolitan University. Uh, we have a, a student housing a student housing property really I would say on the campus there, part of a larger student student building. We have other student facilities in the area, but we do have a 16 story, uh, sorry, 18 story uh, building as part of that. So a bit of an anomaly being right there at Toronto, but we love the student housing space and we're very focused on large universities and the you know, specific opportunities that we can see. Quick note as well, the white circles are medical offices. We bought a portfolio about 18 months ago, I would say maybe close to two years. Real value opportunity. Most of those properties are here in the, here in Ontario, uh, but we look at it the same way as uh, really rent, uh, real estate or housing. I mean, there's a real lack of housing in Canada. And there's a real need for more uh, more healthcare facilities, more healthcare opportunities options in, in Canada. So we're we able to jump in and get that at a very attractive price. I would mean, say it was a real value opportunity. Big difference between medical offices in our portfolio and what we do on the student housing side and on uh, the apartment side is student housing and apartments, we manage ourselves. Centurion staffs in the building, running the buildings, make sure things are done properly, make sure we've got good tenants in place. Um, medical offices, no. We've, uh, we have a partner in there with us who owns 25% of that portfolio. Um, they run the data, they do what they do best. We understand but it's a bit of a different business and we want someone, the right person to do that for us. Uh, and that, that may be something we would sell 
sooner rather than later. Um, see how when we're getting once we get fully leased out. Um, but I say the rest of the portfolio, student housing, multi residential, is really is really what we're focusing on and focusing on very much for the long term. And here it's just you a bit of a breakdown of the portfolio. And you can see we do have multi residential, um, by far the biggest component. We have about ten percent students, two percent of the medical offices that just went over, and the six percent in the lending that we do. The lending has been a great way for us to get start working with uh, very good developers, but again, they're more uh, say, a bit, bit smaller. Uh, I'm not getting the you know the financing they need, say from the big six banks here in Canada. Um, so we get a great relationship with them and help build out a pipeline of potential acquisitions for us. Uh, so it's been a great opportunity for us to do that. But I will show you here, obviously, the performance of the fund really since inception. And our target return for investors is uh, really 7 to 12 percent. And since inception, our annualized return to year end uh, 2023 was 12.75 percent. As we've said, we've had some good years and we've had some, I'll say, very strong years over the like, over 23, 2021 percent. Um, would have been an interesting time right now. Let's go look at 2023 as an example. The portfolio itself is operating at a very high level. Um, we're getting the you know, stabilized occupancy rate in our portfolio is over 98 percent. I mentioned effectively the student housing is 100 percent. So we're seeing like, meaningful increases on rents, on uh, turnover, and I'm sure we do have two properties there. Obviously, meaningful increases in uh, non control areas. Um, so the things we can control are going extremely well. Running the buildings day to day, getting them leased up, the future for say for our portfolio is extremely exciting. It's also very exciting to be very well diversified across Canada as well. I think there's some great markets going forward. Um, so for us, we look at it. The worst thing for investors would likely be 6.52 percent for 2023. That'd be the worst thing they see for the next two years. No guarantees with that. I've done put that caveat in there, but uh, for us, we're excited of the future. We're excited of the portfolio. We're excited to be really, I think, diversified across the Canada with the large population centers that are a bit more moved in the suburbs. We're going to see very strong demand. Again, when people come to Canada, uh, people just growing up in Canada, can't afford, can't spend a million dollars on a bungalow. It doesn't make sense. And even if, especially with the high cost of mortgages these days. And so we're excited about what we can see in the portfolio and help provide a bit of a solution to the housing that's sorely needed here in Canada. Also, like I say, this is a very, very nice and boring fund as well. A lot of excitement out there in the world. And being in real estate in Canada is, I think, as boring as it gets, but I'll say a very attractive uh, investment opportunity for investors. And it will just add to this. Again, it went over the fundamentals. You know, they look very strong here in Canada. We're going to see consistent demand. It's hard to see, even with the pullback in the number of international students, uh, we're still going to see very strong demand coming to Canada. We're going to be chronically undersupplied for the foreseeable future, I would say, to the end of the decade. And uh, we're really well positioned, again, to help, to help investors uh, you know, be part of that. But what we do want to highlight, and this is from the investor's perspective, I think it's very important. I would say we have by far, if you want to go to our website, centurion.ca, you can, obviously. Um, but we have, I would say, the best oversight in Canada, best reporting in Canada. You can go and see one of our fund, our Centurion Apartment Reef. We have a majority of the Board of Trustees, uh, pull out of a KPMG every year. We audit it, we value our entire portfolio every quarter using a third party appraiser. Um, so I do stress, take a look at our portfolio, come take a look at our website and just so you can see, you know, writing our updates from our, from our president, white papers from our president, all, all the you know, financial statements you would want to take a look at. So I think you have, from that perspective, from you invest, as the investor, you would want to see full transparency. And I'll say, really, I would say second and none here in uh, Canada regarding that. So let's see with it's very, very exciting to be a, a landlord in Canada. It's a very should be a very, very boring investment for you from your perspective. Any questions?